King of kings and Lord of lords. He alone has immortality. All these people that say they're immortal, nah, only God is immortal. Dwelling in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power, amen. That's who our God is. The glory of the Lord is everything that makes God God. It's his glory, it's presence, all of his characteristics the author, the authority, the power, the wisdom is immeasurable to us. We cannot measure how good the glory of God is. We cannot measure the importance of the glory of God because that's just impossible for us to do that. So just think about it. Imagine a light so brilliant that there is no darkness. You know, even when you get into a dark place, there's sometimes there's just a, maybe a big light that comes through somewhere. It's hard to be in someone someplace that's absolutely total darkness. There's shadows, dullness, dimming, all that can be present. But have you ever been in a place that was so so dark, and then all of a sudden somebody opens a door, and just kind of almost blinds you the light that comes through. But the light that is with God is so bright that there's nothing that can dim that light. When you're in a totally dark room and you feel like you're all alone, Jesus is the light that comes into that room. You're not alone. Imagine the light shining on your heart that's so bright nobody can dim that light. Nobody can shut the door and dim that light. Why would you ever think about hiding anything from him? You know you can't, right? You know there's nothing that you can hide from God. He sees everything. He knows everything. He's everywhere. That's who he is. It's his glory. Christ is the light of the world. And we are that light. We need to let others know that we are the light of Christ. They need to see Christ in us. They need to know that there's something different about us us because we know who Christ is do you portray that in school do you portray that in work do you do everywhere do you go do you let the light of Jesus shine can they see there's something different about you because that powerful illuminating light of Christ shines on you everyone should see the light of Christ shining through you praise the Lord Praise the Lord and good morning to everybody. Amen. If you heard that I was sick and dying, you heard wrong. <laughs> Amen. Today is, or this week, Tuesday, we will finishing up, I am finishing up, and all on our class, the Deb Bible College class is is our final class of the semester uh, Tuesday night, and the class is on casting out devils. And we have a class of how was it, seventeen students? We have the uh, very, very, very good class, attentive students, and we've learned a lot and. As we've gone through the course, a lot of students realize that uh, they need to be set free from demon influences in their lives. And so we have taught them and, uh, the word, and the, we are uh, uh, finishing up with a prayer meeting Tuesday night. We're going to be casting out devils. Uh, the uh, and uh, I warned them last Tuesday night that as we get closer to the uh, uh, to the time that I don't know if you've ever been in a service where demons are being cast out, but 
when the, the closer the demon gets, and this was, if you read the book of Mark, there's the more stories, more testimonies of Jesus casting out devils than any other book in the Bible. But if, when Jesus cast out devils, and it's been the same experience in my years of ministry, that the closer the devil comes to being cast out, the bigger, the more drama he puts up. It's kind of like in football, they call it the goal line defense. You pull out all, everything you got uh, and when you're down there at the goal line. Well, we're at the goal line, and demons are being threatened. They're being, uh, we have one student who is, is really, really, had a battle. That's one of the reasons I am not up to par today, is because uh, we we set our alarm clock to get up at four o'clock this morning to be ready for the six o'clock sunrise service. And uh, if I don't have eight to nine hours of sleep, I'm really not at my best. I just you, when you get older, you just understand what the compensations you have to make. And so I, uh, I tried to get nine hours every night. Well, uh, I went to bed early last night because Nancy and I, we both agreed we, to get our sleep, we had to go to bed early. It's hard for me to go to bed early because I'm a late night person. And the, uh, so we went to bed early and one thing after another woke me up. And the last one, I was sound asleep. I don't know, it was 10, 30, or 11, or something like that. The uh, Nancy's phone rang, and one of our students was having a crisis. And uh, just really, really a major uh, personal crisis. And uh, he, he wanted to talk. He wanted to pray. And he had fallen off the wagon, and he was drunk. And the... Uh, and he'd been doing so good, badly, now he's coming off of alcoholism. And uh, so we, I talked to him and prayed with him over the phone, and uh, and, and God blessed it, and I, I, they're not here this morning. I, I assume that he's sleeping it off this morning, but they're usually here. But, the, uh, but just hold him up in prayer, and, and he kept saying, I, I want this demon out. I want this demon out. I said, you got it right. And then what you're going through is because the devil threw up a lot of things set in front of him, triggers that caused him to, to uh, relapse. And uh, so uh, uh, he's going to be fine. We're going to cast the devil out of him. Uh, and the, uh, but what we realized as after that, I was wide awake. I could not go to sleep for anything. And so I don't know what time I finally dozed off, but that 4 o'clock alarm really came fast. <laughs> but uh, but uh, what happened out under the shade house is that the, uh, I am still uh, being healed from sugar diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And God is healing me. I'm confessing it. I'm believing it. I'm trusting it. Uh, but sometimes you got to fight the fight. Fight the fight of faith. Uh, so well, I preached out there this morning. And just as I was uh, getting to the, uh, down towards the end of my message, about the last five minutes of my message, I started my feeling myself going unconscious. I felt blackness. I could see blackness, just like somebody was pulling the shades. And I knew uh, that I was in a fight for, my, uh, for, for the day. So I, if you were there this morning, you noticed I, I closed the service pretty abruptly. <laughs> and then I, I, I was standing here at the pulpit, and the chair was right there where Nancy was sitting over there. And I thought, it looks like probably about eight, nine feet. I've got to get from here to there. But I've got to sit down before I fall down. <laughs> and so I made it. But Nancy saw I was in trouble. and the, my, I'm a white man, but what color I have left. 
and I was as white as this, as these clothes over here. The, uh, the, uh, so Nancy, she, she knows the look, and so she jumped up, and she uh, got me set down, and everyone sprayed, and I appreciate it. I'm feeling much better, and that's why, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, that's why I rested between breakfast and this service. I have an office. I have a couch back there. Uh, if you come back to see me and my door is closed, leave. I'm asleep. <laughs> the, uh, uh, so I snoozed a little bit and I f- uh, felt better. Uh, so th- I, we've been testing. Our, I think what happened, my blood sugar dropped while I was preaching. And, then, and I've been through it before. And uh, then I... Uh, and to get that up, you have to take something with sugar. So I was drinking. They were giving me orange juice and donuts and, uh, and biscuits. And, <laughs> and then, then it went too far the other way. <laughs> so <coughs> so we, we just believed God and drank a bunch of water. And uh, it came down between 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock. It came down 100 points. And so I'm back, pretty back to normal, but uh, my strength is a little, you can tell Paul, my voice is not as strong as usual. Uh, so that's why Nancy's taking over today, and uh, I didn't play the keyboard, and we, uh, thanks to uh, the guys for filling in for me. And uh, so I'm just going to preach a short message, and then we, uh, we uh, reached out to Rachel and Arsenio, and Rachel, we found out, got a word for today. She was already thinking about it, so praise the Lord. And God, God has a way of putting things together. And so I'm going to share just a couple thoughts with you. If you've got your Bible, turn with me over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Hebrews, chapter 2. Today is Easter, Resurrection Day. <coughs> and... Uh, Skipped down to focus on verse 14. Uh, 14, my text here is 15, but I want to read the context. And you really need to read the whole first part of this chapter, the first verses to get this. But what he's talking about is why Jesus died. Jesus died, he, he, as he said in verse 14, uh, to share in our humanity. He was God in the flesh. And to to help us out of our sin, to help us out of our addictions, to help us out of our issues, God had to feel what we feel. But God is God. He has never known sin. He has never known sickness. He's never had a disease. God uh, realized that he needed to feel what we feel when we go through things. It's good to see Marianne over here had a heart, serious heart attack, was in Albuquerque, and look at her. She's just as well as she could be. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Mary Ann, right there. Jesus said he needed to feel what she felt. Jesus needed to feel what I felt this morning. Jesus had to feel what our brother is going through that I was talking about this morning. God cannot be addicted. God cannot be afflicted. But that's why Jesus came, believe it or not. Jesus left heaven and and transitioned, and the Bible says lowered himself to become a man, to become one. He was not half God and half man. He left his divinity in heaven and became 100% man. And uh, he, uh, and to do that, uh, he did that so he could experience everything that we go through. And he, he said, I have felt everything that you feel. I've suffered everything you suffer on a physical level, on an emotional level, on a mental level, on a f- relationship level. God says, I have been there and done that. 
So he says, uh, brings us to verse uh, 15, and he calls us children. He says, his children have flesh and blood. He, we, he too shared in their humanity. So that by his death, listen to this, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. He says he wants, uh, he became like us, one of us. We identify with people that are one of us. A lot of people tell me I relate well to Navajo people, even though there's no Navajo blood in me. Uh, I'm adopted, but that's not the same. I always tried to be Navajo. I learned as much Navajo language as, uh, but I'm not smart enough to get it down fluent. I just work at it and work at it. I still comes out, sound like a white man talking Navajo. The, uh, but I was out at Tonalia, Arizona, Pastor Ray Yazzie's church. And his son is the pastor now. Pastor Ray went on to be with the Lord and Rathaniel, 27-year-old Navajo man's a senior pastor. Now, I ordained him myself. Uh, and a wonderful pastor, doing a great job out there. But I went out there to the service, and they wanted me to come out there, and I skipped the service here to be out there on Sunday morning to ordain Rathaniel and help his father install him as a pastor. His father knew he was going and he asked me if I would uh, ordain his son, and uh, then we together would install him as the new senior pastor. Rathaniel, in introducing me to their congregation, he said, keep in mind, I'm the, the place is packed for that special occasion. I'm the only white person there. And uh, he introduced me. He said, Brother Freddie Hall, is here today. He said, do not be fooled by his skin color. He's one of us. <laughs> and I, that's probably the best compliment I ever got in my life. So Jesus became one of us. Human beings, subject to sin, subject to sickness, subject to death. And here's where he said, he came to live like us so as one of us, he could break the power of the devil over us. Does that sound good? And, and the, the, here's what it says. Is, and free, verse 15, this is my text. And to free all... Uh, and to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. I want to read it again and more slowly and put emphasis on key words. He came to free those who all their lives have, were held in slavery. Everybody say slavery. slavery. If you're an addict, you're a slave. If you're an alcoholic, you're a slave. If you're, uh, if you're uh, addicted to anything, you are a slave. And even if you are not an admitted addict, but sin... You have trouble, and it's impossible for you to resist the devil. You have trouble resisting peer pressure. You have trouble, trouble resisting temptation. You have trouble resisting even, uh, even your body. You're not in charge. Your body is in charge, and your, char and your body is subject to donuts, Donuts is your God. Paul said one time, your belly is your God. 
Whoa. Anybody want to leave yet? He said, people who all their lives are slaves, ministering to people. Uh, Nancy and I were counseling with a young man, and I'll not tell who he is. He's here today. He knows who he is. But he's, uh, he told me, he said, I've, I've been addicted to everything. And he, said, and, I've, and he told me one time I was visiting with him, he said, I don't have any more addictions left. And then we were talking, and he was asking about fasting. God was telling him to fast. Because uh, uh, some demons only come out with fasting and prayer, Jesus said. So, the, um, <laughs> so he said, how do I fast? How do I get started fasting? So I went over several things with him, and then I, I told him, well, in Daniel, the book, ninth, book, chapter of Daniel, Daniel fasted desserts. The Bible says he ate no pleasant bread. That's what it is. And, and then there you can put donuts, Twinkies, ding-dongs. <laughs> No pleasant bread, apple pie, cherry pie, whatever it is, no pleasant bread. So I said, maybe you should start just fasting sugar. And then, because I've done some study on that. As a diabetic, I've read up on sugar. Nancy fights diabetes. She's read up on sugar. Sugar, to some people, is an addictive substance. It's a, it's a, your body will crave sugar like it craved meth or alcohol. Sugar. Sounds innocent, doesn't it? Sugar. Such, that's what we feed our kids. Put it in their bottles. It's called soda pop. You know, but it can become addictive. It, it can ruin your health. And if you get off of it, all of a sudden, you will go through withdrawal just like you're coming down off of drugs. And so I said to him, I think I had discernment, and I said to him, maybe you should start with fasting sugar. And he began to explain to me some of the symptoms. And then the light turned on in his mind, and he said, "Ah, I just traded one addiction for this addiction. (laughs) He wasn't free. He just traded addictions. Well, what I'm saying is the devil is trying to kill you. Jesus told us that in John 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And, but the Bible says Jesus came to, for, to free. Everybody say free. Free. Jesus came to set us free. Set us free from all, uh, free all who all their lives were held in slavery. Let me just tell you something. Since Jesus came, there's nothing too hard for you to get free from. Thank you, Harry. That's good. That's the best amen I ever got. Nothing's too hard. You can be set free and will be set free from slavery. And the slavery in this case, the worst slavery of all, is not the slavery to a substance, not the slavery to a liquid, but it's a slavery to fear. Set you free all who have been a slave to fear all their lives. Hallelujah. Somebody should clap like you mean it. He came to set us free from the fear of death. The fear of death is worse than death itself. Worse than death itself. The fear... You know what sets you free from the fear of death? Is knowing that you're ready for death. 
I've, I've battled in my mind all week whether to share this story with you or not because it's being recorded. But I think I will. I just lost a very dear friend and I drove a th over a thousand miles to be at his funeral last week. And this is the man that preached the message is in his services that as a 17-year-old kid, I surrendered my life to God because of the word he preached to me. That I gave myself to the Lord and said, God, I'll, preach, I'll give my life to preaching the gospel. It was in his service. He was only one year older than me. He was 18. But God used him to reach me, a rebellious preacher's kid, disobedient. Marie had always, she knew me. She always says I was naughty, whatever. You know what that means. But, and I looked up to him like I've never looked up to another person in my life. I looked to him for advice. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. The, uh, But he got disappointed early in, a, in life in the ministry. I don't know if you realize it, but ministry is a dangerous profession. People shoot at us verbally. We do spiritual battle. And this man was doing very good in the ministry for a young man. Accomplishing a lot for the kingdom. But he got hurt. He got so hurt that he said, I don't want to be a pastor anymore. He got so hurt that he said, I don't believe anymore. He totally backslid, went back into the world. He was the best man at my wedding, Nancy and I's wedding. I was the best man at his wedding. His father married us. Closer than my brothers. But when he went back, not only did he fall back into sin, he fell into immorality. He would harassed me for my faith that he led me into. Well, I got word that he was very ill. His sister texted me because they consider me part of their family. They, at the funeral, they asked me to sit with their family in the family section. And I didn't tell them I was coming. Nancy and I were in Phoenix. But we just decided to surprise them and show up at the funeral. And, but they were so surprised and happy that I came that they, they already had three other preachers speaking that day. They rearranged the whole agenda to make time for me to preach too. <laughs> the... Uh, But they shared this story. He got so sick that he had to quit his job. and He had gotten a divorce because of his lifestyle. His wife just couldn't take it any longer. The, uh, everybody there was wondering which way did he go? Which way did he go? The, uh, and my brother, who was one of the speakers and the pastors in that town, was, one of the, was the first speaker and kind of led the service. 
he shared that, and I, had, I knew it because his sister was and my brother were texting with me the whole time, but they, they checked him into a nursing home. And he just barely got in there, and, he, and then he was just they, calling his ex-wife uh, and calling his sister and saying, I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. They're trying to kill me in here. I don't feel safe in here. And my brother, who's a pastor and very close to the family as well, and his ex-wife was saying, help me get him out of there. We've got to break him out of that nursing home. We've got to spring him. <laughs> so, so they went down there, and he was panicky. He said, I'm seeing there's demons, tormenting demons all over the place. They're tormenting. I'm hearing sounds. Like so, there's seances are going on, worshiping Satan. And he thought the staff at the funeral, at the nursing home was doing it, but it wasn't it. But he was, that's what he was hearing in the spiritual realm. But it was so real, he thought it was so literal in the nursing home. Demons all around. He said, get me out of this place. So my brother and his ex-wife broke him out. <laughs> they checked him out against their will. Took him, they took him to a, another nursing home. And a night there, he called him up. Same thing. Get me out of here. They're trying to, I'm not safe in this place either. His sister texted me and said, don't help him. We're going to leave him there. <laughs> but it was about a month. And my brother was ministering to, there for him. His ex-wife who serves the Lord, she was a classmate of mine in Bible college. She was there every day. She never quit loving him even though they were divorced. You wouldn't know they was divorced except they lived in different houses. The, uh, but Sharon shared with my wife that it was about a month. Every day she was over there. And she would ask her husband, are you ready to die? And She'd make him pray this sinner's prayer again. She did this sometimes more than once a day. And she, she would ask him, are you saved? And he would say, yes, honey, I am saved. I'm right with God now. He quit seeing demons. Here's a man who's not a, a typical sinner. Here's a man who would preach the gospel. Here's a man who grew up in a pastor's home, the man who had taught in Bible college himself. He, he knows the Bible from front to back. He knew what to do. He knew the name of Jesus. And he called out to God. And he assured his ex-wife, Yes, I am ready to meet God. And the text I got last two weeks ago on my phone, his sister said he died peacefully this afternoon. No demons, no fear. See, the torment was the fear of death. But that's what Jesus came for. That's what he accomplished is to t free us from the slavery of the fear of death. Amen. Praise God. So let me just leave you with this and we're going to bring Rachel up. But if you're afraid to die, you need to be right, get right with God. You need to pray and give your heart to Jesus. And ask Jesus to cleanse your heart, cleanse your, forgive your past, and give it to Jesus. 
And we have a lot of people here that knows how to help you with that. Let's praise the Lord. God bless you, Sister Rachel. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> this morning, um, I shared a word. We had a sunrise service at our house our, with our older four children. Two of them were on the phone while they were in college, and I shared something that God had been laying on my heart since, since last Sunday. And um, uh, be careful what you share in your family devotionals because you're going to end up up here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I said I didn't mind. I just felt that God was really laying this on my heart. And um, I just want to first say that I'm just really humbled to be up here to even share the stage with our pastors because, um, <clears throat> you know, I really have learned a lot attending service here. And um, Easter Sunday... Um, is a is heavy, you know, on my heart, and I just wanted to share about it. Um, since last Sunday, Pastor had preached on condemnation. There's no condemnation. Um, it's Romans eight, one, and um, oh, I'm in the wrong verse, the wrong chapter. <laughs> Getting nervous. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And it really got me, in a weird way, thinking about sinners and sin and how um, we've all sinned. You know, it says in the Bible, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. <clears throat> and I started to keep thinking of that word, con condemn, condemnation. And I really, I even looked up the, the definition because I was thinking about um, the state of being condemned, which is strong sh censure or reproof. And usually when you sin in the Bible, the consequence, you know, from, from the, the law of the time, the law of the land, the Pharisees, was you get condemned to death. <clears throat> and... Um, I really just kept thinking about that, and how, how could he forgive us? How could God forgive us? How could he love us so much? And I started thinking about John 8, and uh, where it talks about the, I just started thinking sinners in the Bible, and the adulterous woman came up in my mind. Not, not anything about, about that, but I just thought, you know, what did, what did God you know, say to her, what did Jesus say to her? And it was really legalistic, and the Pharisees were testing Jesus to see what his response would be when it, when it came out, um, see if he would follow the law. And it really hit me how much Jesus knew when to act and what to do um, always. And in uh, John 8, 1 through 11, it's where he went to, you know, Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared in the again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees had brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? And again, they were trying to bait Jesus into, you know, as a trap because... You know, it was being set up for his crucifixion. And I just laughed because I was thinking, what would, what would we do if somebody did this? And it says, Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. <laughs> and I, I was like thinking about adults standing around talking and one just starts, begins to bend down and write in the sand. And like, for me, I, I teach, I'm a fourth grade teacher. <clears throat> and... Um, you know, kids are always doing stuff in the sand, writing in the sand. So I don't know what I would do if an adult did it, but I just <laughs> it just started, like, um, and they just kept questioning him. And he was still um, writing in the sand, and he finally straightened up, and he said, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he just stooped down and started writing in the, on the ground again. 
And uh, uh, it really just kind of, again, brought that forward about sin and sinners and how he doesn't condemn us. He didn't condemn this woman. He didn't say that. And um, it says those who heard began to go away one at a time, probably embarrassed by their actions. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And he straightened him and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And he says, neither, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. <clears throat> and so that just hit me like, you know, God, Jesus is not going to condemn us. Um, and I think sometimes in our own guilt and in our own convictions, um, we, we feel unworthy. We feel unworthy of what Christ has done, the sacrifice that he made for us on Good Friday. And then you know, the glorious arisen of him on Easter. But we think like, man, I don't, I don't want Jesus to know. But they said it earlier, he does know. He already knows. He's, he's omnipotent, omnipresent. He's everywhere. And um, I started thinking, and just God just kept bringing it to me. And um, John 4, 1 through 6 um, it's got a lot of background about the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. <clears throat> and uh, verse 7 begins his interaction with her. And it goes to say to her that um, he asks her for a drink, and she's kind of shocked because at that time, Samaritans and Jewish people didn't really interact. And... She says, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan woman, how can you ask for a drink? And if Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can we get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. <clears throat> and not only is he telling her about eternal life, then she says, Sir, I want this, this water and um, so I won't get thirsty. And he said, Without condemning her, he said, go call your husband and come back. And she's like, whoops, I don't have a husband. And he said, that's right. You know, when you said you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands and who you're with is now not your husband. And I'm not pointing out these specific sins, but I'm just pointing out any sin that Jesus already knew. He already knew her downfall. He already knew what she was struggling with. And when, when we're looking at this and, and, you know, thinking that, that, well, he already knows, so that makes me unworthy to serve, or that makes me unworthy to, to be used by God. <clears throat> and even though this is a short interaction with Jesus, with this woman at the well, even that happened, we can still look and see that he still used her because he says to go back and tell them what you've heard. Go back and share with your whole town. And we go back to um, verse 39, and it said, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And he, t he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. And he took this woman who was not planning on serving God, wasn't serving God at that time, a sinner, and still used her for his glory, for his good, to reach many more people that as a, as a Jewish person, he might not have gone into that town, and he still found a way to reach them by using someone who wasn't perfect, didn't have a perfect life, didn't have all the right choices down, <clears throat> and many became believers. So I, um, I was hearing, a, you know, on, on Facebook, you can get those little videos and stuff, and 
there's a, um, a couple of Christian comedians sometimes that come up and they're pretty funny or I don't know if they're pastors and they're funny or they're comedians and they're Christian <laughs> either, either one <laughs> but uh what was really funny was um he was talking about um uh, I don't I don't want to go to church or here he heals here's people I don't want to go to church they're they're full of hypocrites there they're just full of hypocrites and um And he goes like, man, yeah. He was really thinking about his statement. He's like, so he stated back, and he's like, man, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to go work out. They're full of hypocrites there. You go there, and you see on one side these people who are really advanced and working out and know all the moves and, you know, have the big muscles and in shape. But he goes, you see all those hypocrites over here that are chubby and, just starting out, <laughs> they're not moving the equipment correctly, they're, they're trying to look on their phone for workouts because they don't know how to do the moves, and it was, I just really started laughing, he goes, that's what, what, and you look at the gym, and there's all different levels of fitness there, but he goes, you come to church, and it's the same, we have all different levels of people in their walk with Christ, you know, we have yeah amen let's clap for him you know we have beginners we have people who are learning we have you know medium maybe been saved a while we still low you know have a lot of questions we have advanced over here where they know what's going on they know the bible you know they're here to teach us and um and i just i just kind of laughed about it because i i have heard that even before you know being a christian i've heard about that Ah, oh, hypocrites and hypocritical. They don't love people. And man, can I tell you what? That you can disagree with a person's choices and you can still love that person. Amen. Amen. And you can disagree with some of the things that are going on in the world, but you can still love people of the world no matter what. <clears throat> um, for me personally, uh, I was saved when I was five years old. And um, I got baptized in water when I was seven. And I grew up in Florida. So... Uh, when you get baptized in water, you go to somebody's pool, you know, like it's it's nice, it's fun. And uh, my parents told us, you know, when we were, I was, I was young, you guys are not swimming, we're not there to swim, it's for church, we're doing a baptism, okay? And, um, uh, you know, like kids, you just, in your mind, you're thinking, yeah, okay, okay, we're not swimming, we didn't bring our swimsuits, didn't bring change of clothes, no towels, nothing, okay, we're just going there to watch and be a part of the, the service, because of my older siblings had been baptized in water already, and I, I hadn't yet at, at seven, and um, at this time, I was facing an eye surgery, um, I had, I was, I was risking be going blind, I had an infection in my eyes, and the doctors were at the point where they were going to either um, have to go into surgery to scrape my eye, which could blind me, or leave it and let it run its course, which could blind me. And um, <clears throat> I, I don't know what hit me that day, and I was just really speaking to my parents, and I kept saying, I kept going to my dad, like, Dad, I need to be baptized today. Like, once I got there, like, I didn't think of it, wasn't, thinking of it, but I, I kept bugging him the whole time, I need to be baptized, I need to be baptized today, I need to, I need to do it today, at seven years old, and um, I, finally my dad, you know, thank, thank, thank you, Lord, for parents who are believers, that pray for us, that take us to church, you know, I, I, I believe in that verse that says, raise up your child in the way they should go, when they're old, they will not depart from it, and This is kind of off my sermon today, but if you have children, you know, adult children who are not serving the Lord, believe, 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 because you raised them, you planted that seed, you put the word of God in them, and they will come back to it. Amen. So I, I got baptized in water that day, and that was a Sunday afternoon. And Monday... I had my doctor's appointment for the eye doctor to see what was going to happen. And I remember sitting there, and you guys know as kids, like you remember stories from when you were younger, and you, you only understand them more as an adult. <laughs> 
And I was sitting there just, just you know, that little eyeglasses thing down. They checked my eyes, and I'm waiting. I'm thinking, how long is this going to take? Um, I was happy I was out of school that day, get checked out from school. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I remember, like, man, I wish I could, could sit on the, the doctor's little round stool with the wheels on it. You know, they're always zipping around like, whoosh, whoosh. And I was like, man, that would probably be fun to sit on. Like, that's all your thoughts, your thinking as a child, as a kid. And um, I remember he just kept coming over, looking in my eyes, looking in my right eye, then looking in my left eye. And he kept going back. And I remember kind of looking at my mom like, what is taking so long? And deciding, I was kind of, I knew I was nervous, but I was still young at that age. I didn't under, really understand surgery or what that meant. And, um, and then my mom's kind of looking confused, and I'm sitting there, and, um, like, he must have wheeled back and forth, flipping through the chart left and right, and coming back, looking in my eyes. <clears throat> and he finally asked my mom a question, and he said, it was her right eye, wasn't it? And I'm just thinking, like, man, is this guy, like, nuts? Like, he doesn't remember which eye had the infection? <laughs> and my mom's looking at him like, I mean, this is someone I'd seen since I was two years old because I just had serious eye problems. And, <laughs> and, um, and my mom looks back at him, and she says, yes, it was the right eye. <laughs> and he goes back and forth, back and forth, and he's flipping again, and he goes... I don't know what happened, but there is no evidence of any infection in either of her eyes. <laughs> and I remember being so embarrassed by my mom because she gets up and she starts dancing in the, <laughs> in the doctor's office. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> man, love your moms, guys. No matter how many times they embarrassed you, they love you no matter what. <laughs> but... I, um, I, she goes, she stops me in the parking lot and we leave and, and, and at that time, like I, she had started sharing with him and he was a Christian and she goes, she got baptized in water. And I, of course I tuned out. So he was, she was sharing with him and then we go outside and she, she goes, Rachel, do you understand what happened to you? And I was like, no, I don't have to have surgery. That's all I know. I don't have to wear my glasses anymore. Like literally I didn't have to wear glasses anymore. And I, I didn't understand. And she goes, she just, Jesus healed your eyes. God healed your eyes. And from then on, it's, it's Christ becomes alive to you. You don't see this merely as stories in a book, but you know that he's your savior, that he's your life. <clears throat> and sometimes when we are Christians for so long, or even if we've walked away, coming back, wherever we're at in our walk, we think of these as stories. We go to church on Easter. We tell our kids, you know, Christ rose again on Easter. But from this last week, and I don't know why it's weighed so heavy on my heart, but Christ has just become alive to me again, and the miracle that is what God has done for us, that he sent his only begotten son to give his life for ours. And I started thinking about what level of love that is. <clears throat> what level of love that is that, that God provided that, that Jesus did for us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and um, I went to John 11, and because we had watched a video for our kids, on uh, uh, they have little um, cartoons, uh, Bible stories. I think actually Saddleback Church uh, puts them together. These ones that we were watching, and they watched the story of Lazarus, and <laughs> I couldn't help but watch my little son's face. And he was, like, watching this cartoon. And I like it because it put the Bible story, like, on a level for kids that they could understand. And his eyes were, like, 
like getting bigger and bigger, these little saucers. And finally he looks at me and he's like, oh, he was dead about Lazarus. And he raised him from the dead. And amen, yes. And, and it be just that miracle of, of speaking that, and especially as an adult, as we get older and, and we lose people, um, the more we lose, I think it, the fact that Jesus could raise someone from the dead, that he loved him so much was, was you really begin to understand the miracle that it is. And in verse, um, uh, chap John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? <clears throat> and we start to come down to how much he loves us. And we, we have, I think most of us in here have kids and how much we love our children and how much God our Father loves us that he sent his only begotten son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And how dark that Friday was, you know, that good Friday, how dark it was when he died on the cross. <clears throat> but what is so miraculous and awesome and overwhelming is that that's not where he stayed. Amen. Three days later, he rose again. <clears throat> And as I bring it back to sinners and how much he loves us, even though we're all sinners, that, um, you know, he had to stand in our place as a perfect being, as Jesus, to, to stand in there for us, to take on our sins. And that's why, because we always think of, why do things happen? This was kind of, you know, um, if you say death, a bad thing, man, he went through a lot. He suffered for us. But in the end, God was victorious because he knew death could not hold him. So I, I had a, a song to share <clears throat> to finish it up to... Um, about God's reckless love. And this was first actually sung in church a few years back by our little sister, Tanisha. And ever since then, man, it just sticks with me because in the song, it talks about how we, we can't earn it. We don't deserve it, but he gave it anyways. And God is here for each and every one of you. He's here for each and every one of your children your grandchildren, your friends, any other family who are not serving the Lord right now or are or are struggling or are hurting, God is there for them, and Jesus will be there for you. Can you go ahead and play the, the song? Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. love of God how oh, it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it still you give yourself away how oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God
when I was your foe, you still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of god oh. Praise the Lord. There's some of you here that don't know that overwhelming, reckless love of God. Or if you've known it, you don't feel it now. The love of God is so present right here, right this minute. If you need that, if you need to be able to feel that overwhelming, reckless love of God, come down here and let us pray for you. God is so good to us. He sent his only son to die for us. He didn't have to, but he did. He didn't have to, but he did. If you need more, if you want to understand that overwhelming, reckless love of God, come stand down here and let us pray with you. Let us help you get to that place that you know that overwhelming love of God. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, help us know, help us understand that overwhelming, reckless love of God. We don't deserve it, 
none of us, not a one of us, deserve what God did for us. Oh, but he did. 